One of the pro problems with being one of the last speakers is that you would have changed your slides around if you knew the tenor of the meeting that you're willing to attend. Um, so I may have, I would probably would have changed things around a little bit, but uh, I'm up here now and so I can't make any apologies for that. On the other hand, um, there's some benefits to this. Um, one of which is, in fact, maybe the most important one is, is listening to the tone uh, that's set by the uh, plenary sessions. Um, the, all of us who listen to kind of some uh, potentially dire predictions um, from the audience addressed to the front bench about the survivability, longevity of trace evidence analysis and microscopy um, on the first day uh, I think a lot of us have thought about the closing of trace evidence sections and trace evidence sections being reduced in some cases when they still exist to nothing more than uh, you know, a laboratory that does, uh, let's say, GSRs or interprets GSR results all days or, or something else uh, more akin to what we might consider the blood alcohol unit doing instead of something that's actually challenging scientifically. Um, I maintain, and I've maintained to my students uh, in my workshops, I'm not as fortunate as the people who uh, get to have students for their whole academic career. I get, I get, I've had many of you in the room for a week at a time trying to inculcate some of my ideas. I think people take things better from their professor than they do from their one week short course <laughs> instructor. <coughs> but the thing that I say and that I believe, uh, as you'll see because of my historical interest in forensic science, and particularly in forensic microscopy, is that maybe one way for us to continue to survive and even flourish is to go back to our roots, some of which I hope to talk about here, and many of which, uh, uh, the examples of which we all heard uh, during the week. And by that I mean uh, actually helping uh, police officials who are investigating crimes, not just preparing our evidence for presentation in court, but um, helping along where the, granted the chances for uh, um, making mistakes are larger, but the penalties for guessing wrongly are smaller than they are in the courtroom. Uh, where we're actually trying to, to uh, facilitate the development of an investigation to lead to, some, to, lead, uh, to something. Ray had a great example, Ray Palmer had a terrific example of something like that, I thought, on the, on the very first day of uh, the, the plenary session. Um, so with that in mind, and my own uh, particular bias, since I'm the one in front of the microphone <laughs> right now, uh, I can, uh, I would like to present first of all um, some historical examples because those have str so strongly influenced me in my career. When I was a kid with my first microscope, I was one of these rare people who knew from very early on, oh, I didn't realize it was rare until uh, until today, who knew from a very early age exactly what I wanted to do. I got my first microscope, as many of you know, at eight years old. I spent money I didn't have to buy microscopes and supplies and things, and my long-suffering wife Peggy had to put up with things like, what does this microscope do that these 17 other microscopes don't do? <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, um, I've, I've found them to be useful, and I don't regret one single purchase, with, as with most things. The only uh, purchases I regret are the ones that I didn't make as far as microscopes go along the way. But in select, so I decided to pursue this from, uh, for the first part anyway, from the point of view of hi history. The, the, the kinds of cases that got me interested in forensic microscopy in the first place, and um, more importantly, I guess at least in my particular situation, um, the heroes that I developed at that time and who I've been constantly trying to live up to, um, um, well, since those early days in the, in the great old reading room that doesn't exist anymore in Chicago at the Chicago Public Library, we'd pull out books and read for the first time about uh, Edward Oscar Heinrich and Edmund McCard and uh, Van Leyden Hulzebosch and Albert Schneider and these people, some of whom I would like to talk to you about a little bit this morning before we get into a, to a, to an actual case. Um, where, where I did this kind of work. So, so first of all, I had to select some cases, and I hope I made a good choice. As I say, um, being at the end of the meeting and hearing everything that's preceded, I don't know necessarily that I have, but I hope I can interest some of you, many of you, especially my colleagues who uh, <laughs> I've been looking at on the podium and who are looking, some of whom are looking at me on the podium now for the last 
25, 35, and 40 years in some cases. Um, we'll know some of these cases um, either because we all know about them or they've heard me talk about some of these before. Um, but I hope I've got a couple things and some pictures in the course of, uh, of um, my researchers over the years, not my laboratory researchers, but my historical researchers, that have allowed me to find pictures and things in some cases of some of the cases uh, and items of evidence in the case, for example, that I had never actually seen with my own eyes but only read about. But as I said before, I hope, uh, especially the younger microscopists, or excuse me, the younger forensic scientists, trace evidence examiners in this room, um, who are not familiar with these cases, will enjoy some of the, uh, I don't know what the right word is, the, the, uh, the find um, some of the inspiration, I guess, that I found you know, uh, so many years ago, over 50 years ago now, actually, uh, well over 50 years ago, um, when I first discovered what they could do and made me want to get my first micro, actually I had a microscope, but I wanted to be able to learn more about how to use the instrument. So I, um, I, I, I passed up certain people. Um, we've got uh, Martin here from the Netherlands. Uh, I was hoping to talk to him, and maybe I'll still have a chance before we break up, about one of my favorite, but one of the least known of the early forensic scientists, C.J. C. Van Leeuwen Hulzebosch who practiced in Amsterdam. His father, uh, his family for many generations were pharmacists, but he became a, a confluence of Locard. Uh, he was very well known, you see a, you'll actually see a picture of him later. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna have the time to talk about his cases. Uh, when Bill talked to you all about the, the savory subject of vomit and stomach contents the other day, I couldn't help but think of Albert Schneider in one of the first cases that he did, uh, who preceded Kirk out in California, and Heinrich for that matter, um, which was the analysis of a vomit stain that included not only what the person had eaten, but also the medical preparation which had caused the process that resulted in the stain. Uh, he also, though, uh, worked on a fantastic case where a prominent uh, 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 Californian back in the 1920s was uh, threatened by a bomb of dynamite sticks tied together with twine uh, set on his front porch. The bomb fortunately did not go off before I mean, it went off, uh, it did not go off, it was, it was found and dismantled, but on the basis of an examination of the dust particles that were on the string, and interesting in terms of the, you know, the techniques we talk about today for sample preparation and analysis, uh, Heinrich, or excuse me, um, Schneider used no more than his microscope and his reagents, um, uh, but he was able to shake the string up in water, let the water settle in a sedimentation tube, analyze all the dust, and gave a very complete description of a particular type of farm, which would include certain kinds of domestic animals, a stream with fast running water, certain trees. And when the detectives were going out to uh, interview uh, a potential suspect in the case, they actually passed by a farm that had all these qualities. And uh, in, in point of fact, it was found that the, uh, that the, the farm that they actually did go to, the um, owner uh, recommended them to the st uh, place next door where some disgruntled workers who were eventually found to be the ones who had uh, set the bomb uh, had disappeared a short period of time ago. But he had given an exact reconstruction of this, of course, all with his old fashioned tools, you know. Uh, uh, anyway, um, so sometimes the old fashioned tools work, but the brain was sharp and I think that's the thing that distinguishes us. Anyway, so please look at this from the point of view of uh, hopefully being inspirational if you don't know about these things, finding out a little more about some of these people, at least the ones who were my, my heroes growing up, and uh, also think about the possibility that we can provide, um, well I say us collectively in trace evidence, we don't always need something to compare with. We can actually help investigators in many cases as long as we're willing to be analysts and not mere comparators, which is in some cases reasons I think why uh, in some quarters anyway trace evidence analysis has fallen on, on rough times. You've got to be able to analyze things. We're, we're chemists. We should be able to figure out what things are. I will just one more anecdote before I start into the actual talk proper. And I'm not doing this to, <laughs> to fill the time allotted to me. I, ha I, I, ha I do have a lot of material I'd like to get by, but I think it's important to set the stage. Um, we used to have, back in the old days at McCrone Associates when Dr. McCrone owned it and when he was still alive, we used to have 24 hours, excuse me, after 5 o'clock at night and, and going till uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, we had, we had guards and the guards were drawn from Area 1 Homicide in Chicago. 
uh, Sergeant Tom Ferry made a list, guys who wanted to make extra money. One guy went to the flight school, another guy got his master's and his PhD in uh, forensic science. Actually, he was a police officer. His name, by the way, you, you may find amusing, it was his parents had a sense of humor. His last name was Manella, and his first name was Sam. Samuel Manella, Sam Manella. So I hope, <laughs> but anyway, Sam Manella was one of the guards, and other old Macron people here may, may remember him. In any case, they used to love us back at, uh, at, at Walters, Macron Associates, because uh, he said, we take the stuff to the crime lab, and they say, bring something in to compare, and we'll tell them, and we'll look at it. And he said, you guys, we bring you stuff in from murder cases, and you tell us what to look for. Because <laughs> we look at the stuff, we give them some ideas, and we, we would help them out. So that was, uh, to me, uh, you know, as a young microscopist, um, a kind of a neat opportunity to have in those early days, getting stuff right from police and trying to provide investigative leads and trying to play, like when you're first married, my wife always says, when we were first married, we said, I was like playing house. In those days, I was like playing detective. I got the opportunity to look at real cases and sort of figure things out and try in some small way to emulate those heroes from the, from the books I had, had read about. The card. We just had a uh, wonderful session yesterday with, with uh, last night with ASCII. I imagine everybody or most everyone was there. Uh, there was a terrific award given out. And thanks to Chris Taylor, who actually um, uh, visited uh, with uh, uh, Edwin McCard's uh, daughter and granddaughter. Uh, uh, ASCII, anyway, now has a, a legitimate, high quality award to pass out. And for those of you who weren't there, uh, you'll find, I think, every, it was a unanimous decision that the best person in the U.S. and the world got it, um, Scott Ryland, who I think we all owe a lot, a lot to. And uh, anyway, there was a general happiness going on that Scott got this award. But anyway, it really is a serious award, and it's, it's named in honor of Lacard. Um, Lacard, um, and there's, a, there's actually two recent biographies. Thanks to, pa thanks to Patrick Buzzini, I found out about one, and in buying the one, I found the other. And I could work through the French well enough, although I may have some misconceptions nonetheless. Um, so, you know, uh, Le Card, the date is important because I'm going to talk about somebody else who was born two years later, was born in uh, who you haven't heard about, uh, or not much. Some of you may have heard about him. Um, in 1877, uh, Saint-Germain, France, he uh, came from a pretty, you know, good family. He studied to be a medical doctor. He studied some of the influence, though, in his latter years of Lacassin, the, the famous uh, French medical jurist. And um, eventually, as we all know, he went on to form uh, uh, an internationally renowned laboratory. And all of us invoke um, one of the few principles of uh, uh, that, for, for that forensic science has of its own. We're a hybrid science, as Perk said, but we have some, we need to have some principles of our own and Lacard's exchange principle, even though he himself didn't call it that. Uh, and while there are various people say different things, I think it was L.C. Nichols who first called it that in his book on scientific investigation of crime. Others may, uh, may dispute that. But in any case, um, we invoke that and we have look hard to thank for it. And although he worked in many areas, almost every area that we consider in forensic science, because he studied documents, um, he uh, was, uh, studied weapons, and of course, well, I shouldn't say of course, but to me, the most interesting thing was that he studied dust which was the young microscopist I was interested in. There, there, his French, uh, um, uh, his writings were in, were in French, but he did um, have some of his articles translated. And the ones that are most accessible, fortunately for me, were the, were the three-part series on the analysis of dust traces, which appeared in the old and now defunct, the long defunct um, uh, American Journal of Police Science, which, uh, which uh, became the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology at some point. Anyway, um, Lacard was interested not only in, uh, in writing and doing research and in writing about his ideas on, on nascent, at that point, forensic science, but, but he also did case work and he um, examined the case work of others. So if you want to, even though there's some articles which are very hard to find, and may, you know, who knows where they exist anymore, but if I heard, read for the first time, and if you read his works, you will also, um, for the first time about the analysis of uh, dust and earwax, for example, um, and, and you know nasal cavities. So he looked at these things. I first heard he talks about Professor Pariso, who took a, a walk 
for the students and envir um, environments of uh, NASA, France, and then they analyzed all the layers of the shoe to see where they had walked, and they got it all correct. They weighed, uh, they weighed thought there was rain, so they had ideal conditions. But I'll talk to you about a real case of that sort done in those days. So people were, um, they were experimental, they did things as scientists, they didn't perhaps, um, they didn't have equipment methods or the luxury of some of the things uh, that, that we talk about at these meetings as far as standard methods and so forth, forth goes. But what they did have working for them was a passion for what they did, they had the intellectual capacity, they fully utilized the instruments, instrumentation and, and techniques of chemistry, biology, physics that were available to them at that time. And they, they were like uh, people often point to the forefathers of America. We had these wonderful people, intellectuals, George Washington, um, certainly uh, Thomas Jefferson and, uh, and uh, Franklin. I mean, the people world, uh, now I don't know about Washington this year, but certainly Thomas Jefferson and Franklin were world renowned as, as scholars and in Franklin's case as a scientist. Um, we were fortunate in, in those days in forensic science to actually have those kind of people doing this work. I didn't realize that, again, as a kid reading these things, I just thought they were neat cases and things I wanted to learn how to do. Uh, Lacard, um, I thought this was appropriate this meeting where ASCII played such a big role. Uh, Lacard, who you see on your right, uh, sitting next to people you may not have seen pictures of, but there's, there's certainly some of these names were brought up before. Certainly the fellow to Lacard's immediate right. Uh, anybody, just out of curiosity, anybody know who sitting right next to Lacard on the right? That's Georg Popp, who's been talked about several times in regard to the first, you know, one of the first recorded uh, cases of forensic geology. Uh, next, to immediately to his right, is uh, C.J. van Leyden Hosebosch from Netherlands, and then Siegfried Turkel from Vienna. In fact, this meeting was held in Vienna. And unfortunately, I cut him off because of the, the picture I wanted to be as large as possible. Suddenly, Mark Bischoff, who was from Lausanne, Lausanne was the immediate successor of, of uh, Rudolf Archibald Rice, R-E-I-S. And Rice was the um, founder of probably the oldest, certainly the oldest continuing institute of forensic science. So we have two people who've actually graduated, maybe more that I know of in this room right now who graduated from that program. Uh, Claude Rowe and Patrick Lazine. They both trace their lineage back to Rice, who started even before Lacard did. In fact, Lacard was a great friend of Rice and vice versa. Um, unfortunately, Rice uh, um, <laughs> got religion, you might say. Uh, became an, an advocate for the Serb cause after the First World War and sort of gave up his forensic science students. But Mark Bischoff uh, took off um, and continued. Anyway, the point of this picture is, though, I would encourage the, the, the founding members of ASTI to get together and take a picture because in 30 or 40 years or maybe longer, people are going to be given a talk about this, and they would like to have a picture to show of all of you who, who got together, all these you know, well-known criminalists who got together, forensic scientists, and sitting around at the table there, um, uh, founding, uh, you know, the founding members of ASTI. So I recommend that to you. It's nice to have pictures of things. I just love being at meetings with, with Ed Suzuki because Ed's always got his camera. And I have all these great pictures of a lot of meetings because Ed's always taken, taking good shots of things. Kirk, of course, uh, well, I shouldn't say of course. Kirk, you couldn't find out about these other people without reading about Kirk. And we have a number of Kirk graduates. I'm looking at Keith Inman uh, right here. But we have these Kirk people um, uh, um, in the room, uh, people, I, uh, people I know, admire. Uh, in fact, everybody from Kirk's program uh, that I'm aware of turned out to be great forensic scientists. It's like little Peter DeForest turned out. First rate people. But Kirk, who was originally a biochemist, um, really took off after the Second World War uh, with using his knowledge of uh, chemistry, microchemistry, and microscopy uh, to really start um, systematically examining trace evidence, at least for those of, uh, those of us in the United States. I will talk about earlier cases, but interestingly enough, they were also in Berkeley where Kirk was settled down, but, but I'd like, if I, I'm going to make you read something here, ask you to read something. This is from Kirk. I could have quoted a lot more, but you wouldn't have read it. I'm hoping that with this much, you might actually read some of what he had to say, and I will uh, read it for you if you're too lazy. The meticulous and thorough nature of the work which is necessary in the examination and segregation of microscopic evidence uh, is a detriment to its general use. Um, in real life, it probably is. Uh, probably lab managers don't 
flight for people spending all that much time doing this. Is it best, uh, is, it, excuse me, is it times trying on the patients and requires a significant amount of time? Again, another thing laboratory directors don't like. But uh, again, as we all know, unlike CSI, it actually takes us time to do this stuff. It must always be remembered, and this is, I'm skipped down, <coughs> that the proof of a single fact is more important than any number of theories, hunches, uh, uh, leads or hunches. Microscopic evidence is capable of providing facts of great significance. And I could have quoted Kirk, you know, uh, ad nauseum, as they say, uh, because he had so many good things to say. I correspond with Kirk, Kirk when I was a kid, and I've lost my letter from Kirk. A couple years ago, Keith Inman, who's now in, in charge of Kirk's uh, uh, archives, uh, was going through it. And one, he didn't tell me. He just one day he sends me in the mail. I get a thing. There is the there is the carbon copy of Kirk's response of my original, the very first time I ever talk, uh, wrote to Kirk, my original handwritten letter in my, you know, 15-year-old, whatever it was, handwriting at that time. So thank you very much, Keith, for that. It's a, it's a terrific uh, memento to have. And he was, he was nice. I mean, he, the, you know, I'm some dumb kid from Chicago, and he wrote me this letter, other letters and things over the years, and we were in, uh, in constant, um, I shouldn't say constant, uh, intermittent contact over the years, but he would always graciously reply to any letter I had, including later on in my Army intelligence days when he wrote to me in Germany and he had, he had cancer at that time already, so he thought that it was not going to be possible for me to ever be his, uh, his student. But he gave me good advice on, on science, and I give it, to, give it to my own sons, I give it to my own students, um, one of which is you might think of with your own uh, children that you want to, to do well in school. So, um, one piece of advice I would like to give you, I'm paraphrasing or close to quoting as well I can, is that whenever you take a course in science, you know, remember it, understand the principles, and don't just learn enough to pass examinations. And that has proven such great advice over the years. So all these little things you learn about physics and chemistry, the facts, the details, are, are so extremely useful in day-to-day -day work. I love pointing that out to, to students that, you know, you thought that wasn't useful, but see, it really is. It really, it really works. Science works. Getting on to the, uh, the topic, main part of the topic at hand. Um, today, um, microscopical, microscopic trace evidence is used almost exclusively in the courtroom, right, to help with a, with a case one way or another. Um, although, as examples showed here, that's not always the case, right? Uh, it can be used for investigative leads. However, it was formally utilized, as I hope to show, by several uh, historical examples, and then one um, recent example from, uh, from my casework. Um, it was formally used extensively in this way. Um, one of the things about using it that is going to trouble people who only want to do standard methods and can't do anything that's outside of that range is the fact that it does not rely on um, this, these artificial constructs, these SOPs and... Um, and cookbooks. What it does rely on, though, is something that goes back much further, and that's the scientific method. That's the way you analyze unknown materials. That's the way you analyze unknown phenomena and try and make some attempt to understand them. And then um, it, there can often be great pressure not to do that. In fact, one of the things which, although it's good for business, is not good for forensic science, I don't think, is that we get cases from all over the world now because their people are not qualified to do something, and yet they send it to us, assuming that we are qualified to do it. We are, I assume that we are. We don't take on cases that we don't think we can't do well, but it's, uh, it's sad from the point of view. In fact, the first way when I, when I for Dr. Macron sold Macron Associates and I quit to start Microtrace, the only thing I missed was colleagues. It's going to be sad to come to one of these forensic trace events meetings and find that there are no colleagues in the audience to listen to papers or give talks on what they've done. Um, we have to somehow, in addition to having all these things done to us, become advocates for science, the science part of forensic science, and without, before they turn off the power and everything else stop and stop there. Anyway, these people were accused to using evidence from dust and other debris, in addition to all kinds of other things. Of course, there's fingerprinting going on, early experiments with firearms comparison and so forth. I'd like to talk first about probably one of the best known cases ever, and, but it's, in my case, it's the one that 
after I heard about Ricard first, but then I heard about this fellow out in Berkeley, Edward Oscar Heiner. He was, uh, uh, he was had a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry, which he had to work for. He arrived at Berkeley with a couple dollars in his pocket, uh, but he had studied with a pharmacist. He, in fact, he originally wanted to be a pharmacist, but he had learned, you know, from long hours of study, he had learned a lot of practical chemistry, which kind of like to think my brother and I learned in our home lab when we were kids. I mean, uh, you know, nowadays you can hardly, at the university, they don't want you to make bony, you know, we were making it in our basement and stuff like that uh, when we were, when we were kids, uh, extracting these things. But anyway, he, um, he had an interesting career. I mean, uh, he, was a, he was a city manager for a while uh, in, a, in a city. He came back, took over uh, this fellow named Theodore Keitka, who was a document examiner in Berkeley. He took over his practice, and although it was a document examination practice, which Heinrich did, he expanded it to other things, and he, he played a prominent role in, a, 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 in the uh, Hindu Gadar case, it's called. It was during the Second World War where, when uh, German, the German Council was trying to get Indians uh, in British under the British Raj to, to revolt so British troops would be taken away from the other battlefronts and have to go to, uh, to India. And there were, there were a lot of messages that passed through the US. US, they brought in Heinrich to analyze the inks and everything. In fact, he said he could not do a good examination of the documents themselves unless he learned the, the languages and the dialects. And so <laughs> they thought it was nuts, but the British provided him with tutors. He learned them well enough to be able to actually read the documents in the original languages and then do take all that into account. So when you talk about what you need to know in certain cases, I think there's an example there. Sometimes you need to know very little. Sometimes you need a good, good deal. It depends. It's, it's question dependent. What question has been asked? And that's something, again, that doesn't fit very well into the standard method, but fits very well into the human mind that's, a, that, that's, an, that's an inquiring mind. Anyway, the case that got my attention, and uh, you know, perhaps I can say most of the people in this room may, may have heard this, but maybe you haven't seen some of these pictures before. Um, <coughs> on October 11th, in 1923, uh, southbound uh, express train, train number 13, was of all things passing through Tunnel 13 in the Siskiyou Mountains not far from uh, Ashland, Oregon. And Bonnie Yates is here, her, 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 where she lives right now, not far away at all from where Bonnie lives. Um, fellows got on the train uh, at one end of the, of the tunnel. Um, other guys were waiting at the other end when it came out. They stopped the train when it was just outside the tunnel. The, the, the engine, the, the tender, and the mail car just behind had just come out of the tunnel when it was stopped. And uh, there were, uh, there were words with the firemen and the brakemen. But anyway, in a short period of time, to make a long story short, and it is a long story, but an interesting story, um, the, the firemen, the, the, the uh, brakemen, the engineer, um, and eventually, as you see, the postal clerk were all lying dead. They were all shot. Um, some fellows, there was, there's a, there was a ridge on the side. Some, some people came down from the, from the side there, were waiting on the other end of the tracks after it was stopped. And in a scene which could only, I think, have been reminiscent of the movie of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you remember when they blow up the mail car? Um, they, <laughs> they blow up the mail car, there's nothing left. And the poor mail clerk died in his post, so he was the fourth victim. I always think of that, whenever I'm telling a story, I think of that scene in Butch and Sundance where, where uh, Robert Redford says to, to Paul Newman, think you need, used enough uh, dynamite there, Butch? <laughs> anyway, that was the problem these guys had. Maybe they got the idea for the movie from that. But anyway, uh, it was blown up. And the, but the guys got no money, but they hightailed it, as, as they would say in those days. The only piece of evidence, or there are a couple pieces of evidence that were left behind. I mean, police dogs couldn't find any, but uh, they sent people out, they got posses and stuff out there. Looked all over the place, couldn't find anything. But they did have, throw away, there was a detonator. Uh, the fellow who got on the back of the train had, had dropped a 45 uh, caliber automatic, and uh, there was a pair of greasy overalls. After some period of time, the uh, overalls, um, uh, the, the, the posse, I guess, which they had in 1922 uh, in those days, um, decided that it was the, the, the battery that was with the detonator and the grease stains looked a lot like uh, you know, stuff you might pick up in a, a mechanic's place. So they went down, mechanic walks out into town, mechanic walks out, he's got uh, greasy overalls, they arrest him. But there's nothing else on the guy. He's got nothing else. And several days later, they finally decide that they are going to uh, seek outside help. So at this point, you've got the government involved, you've got the Postal Inspection Service, you've got the Southern Pacific Railway investigators involved, and of course, the local police. 
and they're all trying to figure out what's going on. But the, the feds, remember, had worked with Heinrich before on the World War I stuff and other, other kinds of things. So they said, let's, let's call in Heinrich. So they send this stuff down to Heinrich. And a couple days later, they get a report back. And this is the part that I loved when I was a kid. Well, they, well, they eventually got a report. They got a, they got a, uh, they got a telegram, first of all, that said, you're holding the wrong man. The man you want is, a, is about uh, somewhere around 20 to 28 years of age. He's uh, about 5 feet 10 inches tall. He has light sandy hair. Uh, he's a uh, lumberjack who works in the Pacific Northwest. Um, he's a very fastidious person. And by the way, he's a, he's, he's a left-handed lumberjack. And so they read this report and they say, sure. <laughs> um, but the government people had worked with Heinrich before. So they decided to jump on a train, one that wasn't going to be <laughs> blown up, <laughs> and uh, run down to, uh, down, come down to Berkeley. They met with Heinrich in his laboratory and explained all his conclusions. He said, you arrested the lumberjack because of the grease on his clothes. Well, I examined the grease. It's not grease, first of all. It's pitch, and more specifically, it's pine pitch. Okay, and, and he goes on and on. I mean, he did have some lucky breaks in this case. He got hair, so he kind of got the hair color. Um, the age, at least in the descriptions now, s now in the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, Paul, Paul Doherty has been there, and somebody else, I can't remember who's been there, looking through Heinrich's papers, which are all there. But in, in the presentation, it says, uh, or in, the, in, in Eugene Block's book, The Wizard of Berkeley, it says that, um, and this, this, I tracked this back. This was actually an Austrian uh, medical legal expert who said you could tell the age of a person by cross-sectioning the hair and then looking at the, the rings, just like tree rings, and sort of count them up. <laughs> so I don't know what, uh, if, if Heinrich told him that or if that was something that came. Anyway, I don't think we can believe that. But maybe Heinrich was lucky on that one. If he got the hair color, basically they were stuck in the buttons. So he decided he was a lumberjack by a number of things. First, he's got pine pitch on his clothes, the way the pants were uh, rolled up and everything. He got the height of the guy from, you know, making measurements, which when you get, in, you now finally, you know, as I cover this, you can see the, uh, you can see the actual outraws themselves. That's in front of the door in Heinrich's laboratory. You'll see a picture later of Heinrich. I think I've got it in here. And those are his bookshelves on either, on either side. But anyway, um, he uh, said he was fastidious because he found fingernail clippings in the pocket. Usually people are going to clip their fingernails, they toss them somewhere else. This guy clipped them, stuck them in his pocket. And he said he was a left-handed lumberjack because he found, first of all, Douglas fir in the pockets, but he didn't find them in the left-hand pocket. Then he went to the uh, back, chopping a tree. You might expect that you would get the, the, any particle to come up in the right side. Well, they're on the left side, so he postulated, anyway, that uh, the, the person was a left-handed lumberjack. But anyway, um, Heinrich then really wowed him. He, after he went through all this, explained how he'd reached all his inferences, he gave them the name of the person who owned the overalls. Now, that was a bit of luck, but Heinrich said, it always takes me at least 24 hours to examine some clothes, and everybody had gone over these things before, you know, of course, not in any systematic fashion, not like we would. Um, but he said, I always make a point of, of, of reaching in every pocket, emptying everything, pulling it out. In fact, I, that advice has served me well over the years, and I, I suspect that those of you who are trained well are all, also do the same thing. But you can tell so much from the dust in somebody's pocket. We had, for example, in Illinois, we had a, a little boy who was found decomposed in brand new, what appeared to be brand new clothes. But one of the things that pr helped prove they were brand new clothes, if you ever reach in the bottom of your pockets, unless the clothes are new, if they've been washed even once, and certainly they've been removed more. I'm going to see if I can. Actually, I haven't worn these pants before. <laughs> but uh, I guess they don't have anything. I was going to pull out a clump of lint for you. There's always a clump of lint with stuff in it as soon as you, as soon as you wash your clothes. Anyway. Um, he reached in, there was a pen pocket, and he reached in because, oh, one of the things he found was kinikinik, which is a local on um, the Northwest, it's something called Indian tobacco, and it's used by people who often roll their own uh, cigarettes in those days. So he started looking around for cigarette cases. So he reaches inside and pulls out, uh, a, well, it's no longer damp, but you can see it had been wet and everything it was all messed up. Um, uh, but he unrolled it, and it wasn't a cigarette wrapper, it was a registered mail receipt. And by using chemicals, UV light, iodine, staining, everything, he was able to actually bring out names on there. And it was, it was uh, registered, it could be traced back by the postal department to a Hue de Atrimo. So the, the authorities jumped on this. They uh, went down to visit the parents. The boys had been missing for a couple of weeks. 
uh, and they were going off on some money-making adventure, and they hadn't seen them since. Well, it turns out that there were three Atremont boys, um, and what, two of them were twins, and one of them was not, but they'd all gone missing together. At that point, uh, according to the, the record, the largest manhunt in U.S. history uh, began because it was the, what turned out to be the last of the big-time Old West train robberies. In fact, while I have an interest in it, and hopefully some of you have an interest in this, uh, the other group of people we're not so well, we're not so close to. That's all the train enthusiasts, old-fashioned train enthusiasts, look back to this as like the great, you know, final uh, triumph of the, of the old-time train robbers. Uh, I guess not triumph, they didn't, they, as it turns out, you'll see, they didn't get away with it. But they, at this point, they still hadn't gotten away with any money, they just disappeared. Anyway, they kept raising the ante on this, and finally, what do I have there? Right here, whoops, no, not yet. Um, finally, they uh, um, did, about uh, 70, uh, 1927, um, a sergeant coming back from the Philippines on duty in San Francisco was looking at the post office, which I used to religiously go down to the post office when I was a kid after reading this to look at all the wanted posters. I don't know if they have them in the post office anymore, but I used to look at them, copy down all the names and make drawings. <laughs> And anyway, it never, never did me any good. I never captured a criminal that way. <laughs> have to tell you. But anyway, he said, he said, that's, you know, one of the edge ones. I remember which one it was. He said, that's, you know, Corporal So-and-so from Manila. So they had uh, um, Corporal So-and-so report to his commanding officer. They put him on a boat for San Francisco. They got the boat. The federal agents were waiting for him. They picked him up, and they uh, brought him in for trial. Well, that re after all those years later, this brought back all the information in the papers about the case. And they also discovered the two other, the twins were both working in a steel mill in Ohio. So they were also brought in, but, but Hugh, I, I don't know if it was Hugh, which one it was, anyway, or Roy, or Ray, anyway, one of them was put on trial first. They had a mistrial, Heinrich testified. And in fact, it's interesting to read the testimony that, that, that exists, it's hard. Um, as you'll see, there's gonna be a, a picture of the actual, coming up, the picture of the actual uh, Tunnel 13. And uh, for that, I have to thank Ed Espinoza, who's as, as fanatical about all this, this case as I am. He's been trying to track down stuff. In fact, Bonnie brought me a breaking news flash that all the court records, at least that are available in uh, Medford, uh, uh, no longer exist. But anyway, there, there is some stuff about it. And, and Heinrich went through the same kind of picayune <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, defense, withering defense examination that we go through today on the stand. So I thought that was kind of, that was kind of an interesting factor, which I never really know about. Certainly not mentioned in a lot of the other accounts. They just talk about you know, uh, California professor you know finds you know, left-handed lumberjack. <coughs> um, anyway, they were finally had a trial, a mistrial the first time. They had a second trial, uh, whichever one it was was convicted. The other two confessed, and up until recently, um, one of them went insane in prison actually. Um, one of them died in prison, and one of them was actually released in like 1978 or 72 or something like that. So, kind of, a, kind of an interesting case all around. But this I just show you. Um, there's the there's Tunnel 13. You see the little white dot at the end. We walked all the way from there um, up to the front, and Ed took that picture of me standing out there on a snowy day. But that's uh, so it's all been reinforced. The, the tracks, by the way, from the rust, they don't look like it's being used. But you can see what it looked like back at the time that photo on the on your right on your left was taken at the time of the uh, of the um, case so uh, I just think it's interesting because with the tools of the time and without standard operating procedures and stuff Heinrich managed to actually provide a very significant investigative lead in this case <laughs>